Brianna Taylor, the law, the facts. This video is going to shock you. My name is Nate the Lawyer and welcome to the Brody's Bunch where you are the jury of today's content. Now, I'm a former law enforcement officer, former prosecutor, and a licensed attorney. Now, before we get started, don't forget to like this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel if you like this content. So today we look at the case of Brianna Taylor, a 26-year-old black woman who was shot by police executing a search warrant. Now, with any police-involved shooting, we like to look at two things. We look at the law and we look at the facts. And as always, I leave it to you, my jury, to decide the outcome. So first, we always start with the law. And there are two things that we need to address. First, search warrants and use of force by police. And as always, this is not legal advice. So let's start with search warrants. Now, in the United States, if government officials want to search your home, they generally need a warrant. The Fourth Amendment of the Constitution demands that. The Fourth Amendment says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the places to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, in this case, the police had a warrant. So we have to look at whether there was probable cause for this warrant. So what is probable cause? Well, in this instance, probable cause can best be described as whether there is a fair probability that a search would uncover evidence of criminal activity or wrongdoing. Now, if the police can show a judge that there is probable cause, then a judge will issue a search warrant. Let's look at the evidence in this case to see if there is a fair probability that a search of Ms. Taylor's home would uncover evidence of crimes or wrongdoings. Now, the first piece of misinformation put out by the mainstream media is that it was a wrong address. Ms. Taylor's home was a wrong address. Now, here's a clip from ABC saying that. Here's Steve Osinsami. It remains clear tonight that Louisville Metro Police were at the wrong home. And now, this is totally not accurate. This was the right address. It was actually listed on the warrant. Now, I know it's shocking because this is ABC News, but they got it wrong. Now, let's go over the information found in the warrant to see if police had probable cause for a search. So before we get started, I need you to get familiar with some street terms, right, that you may not be familiar with. So first, we're going to talk about what a stash house is. A stash house is a place where drugs and cash are distributed from, right? It's like a distribution center of the drug game. The next term I need you to understand is what a trap house is. A trap house is a place where drugs are packaged and sold to users. Many of you may be familiar with the term crack house, but a crack house is a more specific type of trap house. Now, cops are always trying to move up the distribution chain, right? So you want to move from trap house to stash house. Now, trap houses are usually easier to spot because there's a lot of traffic going into and out of trap houses where stash houses are a little harder to find. So remember, police are always trying to move from trap houses up the chain to the stash house, the distribution center. Now let's get to the facts of the warrant. On December 30th, 2019, police raided three trap houses and arrested some people. Amongst them were Jamarcus Glover and Adrian Walker. Now here's local news coverage of those raids. Piles of drugs and guns. It's part of a big drug bust for LMPD and we were there to see how it all went down. As WDRB's Katrina Helmer reports, the investigation isn't over, Katrina. Three suspects are caught with cocaine, marijuana, and drugs, but LMPD is not closing the case just yet. These houses were hiding dirty secrets. Monday, in the Russell neighborhood, LMPD officers busted into this home on Elliott Avenue for a drug investigation, pulling down security cameras, prying up floorboards, ripping off siding. Police officers searched the vacant property connected to it and this home on Muhammad Ali Boulevard. Officers knew exactly where to look because a confidential informant tipped them off. The citation shows LMPD recovered crack cocaine, marijuana, a scale, five handguns, and three long guns. One of those handguns was stolen. Quantities were not listed in the citation, but LMPD says it was a significant amount of drugs. 
Then, one by one, three suspects were handcuffed and locked up. Daryl Forrest, Rayshawn Lee, and Adrian Walker are facing dozens of charges, including possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, trafficking a controlled substance, and marijuana, and more. All three were given $25,000 bonds, and all three have since bonded out. LMPD could not comment on the bust, saying it's still an ongoing investigation. All three suspects will be back in court on January 10th. I'm Katrina Helmer, WDRB News. Now, one of the people arrested but not mentioned in the news report was a man named Jamarcus Glover, the ex-boyfriend of Breonna Taylor. Now, here's a transcript of a call Glover made from jail to Breonna Taylor. The link is in the description and it's found on TatumReport.com. Now, I have not been able to verify whether this is an actual transcript, but Tatum is usually good at having police contacts and finding this information. So let me read to you the transcript. January 3rd, 2020. Jailhouse phone call. Jamarcus Glover. Jamarcus Glover calls Breonna Taylor from booking. He says, call Doug. Doug is Adrian Walker. Call him on Facebook and see where the blank Doug is at. He's got my blanking money riding around in my blanking car and he ain't even where he's supposed to be. Brianna Taylor responds. You said Doug? Glover responds. Yeah, Big Doug. Brianna Taylor then responds. I'll call him. Why can't I find him on Facebook? What's his name on there? Glover responds. Mercy Walker. Glover calls Brianna Taylor again at 118 from jail. Glover to Brianna Taylor. You talked to Doug? Adrian Walker. Brianna Taylor responds. Yeah, I did. He said he was already back at the trap. Trap mean trap house. Then I talked to him again just a minute ago to see if you had contacted him. They couldn't post bond until one. Jamarcus Glover, just be on standby so you can come get me. Love you. Brianna Taylor responds, love you too. This is all at TatumReport.com. I have not been able to independently verify whether this is accurate, but go to TatumReport.com and see it for yourself. Link is in the description. So let's get into the facts that were presented to the judge that were in the warrant. January 2nd, 2020, police set up a camera to watch 2424 Elliott Avenue. Remember our trap house that was on the news. The camera picked up about 15 to 20 cars going in and out of that location. On that day, police also saw Adrian Walker, one of the people arrested in the raids on December 30th. Now, Adrian Walker was driving a red 2017 Dodge Charger. That same pole camera showed Jamarcus Glover operating that same vehicle. Now, Jamarcus Glover was on camera going into the trap house, dropping off a large blue cylinder shaped object near rocks and then appeared to be covering it up with something to avoid detection. Again, all of this was caught on camera. Now, the warrant does state that Glover has a rap sheet. He was convicted of felony possession of a firearm, felony possession of a handgun, receiving stolen property, which was a firearm, drug paraphernalia, um, buy and possess, and trafficking of a controlled substance. And he's currently charged with possession of controlled substance, heroin and cocaine, tampering with physical evidence, trafficking in marijuana, trafficking in controlled substance, and tampering with physical evidence. We have a trap house. And two men involved in drug trafficking have been seen on camera entering and exiting this trap house. Now, police noticed that the vehicle and foot traffic at these locations decreased when both men were gone, but increased dramatically when they were around. The warrant specifically says that Mr. Walker and Mr. Glover show up operating this red Dodge Charger and appear to be re-upping the drug house at 2024 Elliott. Mr. Walker and Mr. Glover have been seen entering and exiting the property, and it was suspected that they were dropping off narcotics. So what did police do? Well, they followed the red car. So police observed the red charger making frequent stops to different trap houses. And this same car then went to Brianna Taylor's home. Now, on January 16, 2020, during the afternoon hours, police saw Jamarcus Glover in this same red car. He pulled up and parked in front of Brianna Taylor's home then directly went into apartment four, Brianna Taylor's apartment. He then exited the apartment with a package in his right hand and jumped into a car and drove straight to a known trap house. Here's the surveillance footage, driving up, going in, coming out with this package. So police believe Brianna Taylor's home was the stash house, a place where drugs were kept for distribution. 
but not sold. This was their temporary holding spot. Now, the U.S. Postal Inspector confirmed that Jamarcus Glover had been receiving packages at Breonna Taylor's home, and Jamarcus Glover's permanent address was Breonna Taylor's home. Police also showed a 2016 white Chevy Impala parked in front of 2424 Elliott Avenue. Remember, that's our original trap house. And at different trap houses. Now, this vehicle was registered to Breonna Taylor's address. Here's pictures of this Chevy Impala registered to Breonna Taylor. So police requested a no-knock entry warrant to go on this premises. Now, they list the reasons as the nature of how drugs are trafficked there and operated. These drug traffickers have a history of attempting to destroy evidence. They have cameras at the locations that compromise detectives once an approach to a dwelling has been made. Investigation, pulling down security cameras, prying up floorboards. And they have a history of fleeing law enforcement. So the question is, probable cause. Do police have a fair probability that a search of Breonna Taylor's home will uncover evidence of crimes or wrongdoing? Now, that's a question that you have to answer. So today you're going to play judge. Would you sign this search warrant with this information? Was this the wrong address? Remember, police followed this red car going back and forth from Breonna Taylor's home to the trap houses, taking packages back and forth. Now we turn to the police raid. Okay, if you've made it to this part of the video and you're enjoying what you're hearing, consider subscribing to the channel, picking up a channel membership, joining me on Patreon, or even hit me up on PayPal. The reason is, is because this video, just like all the other police videos that I do, are demonetized. I make no money from YouTube or very little money from YouTube doing these videos. So the only way I can do it is through viewer support like yours. So I would appreciate your support. And now let's get back to the video. So the police in executing the warrant had to use force. So our question is, did the police use the appropriate amount of force for the situation? As always, we first look at the law. Our two cases from the federal level is Tennessee v. Gardner and Graham v. Connor. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos, you understand these principles. So I'm not going to go into depth about them, but here's a quick overview. Now, first, let's start with Tennessee v. Gardner. Tennessee v. Gardner establishes that if officers are going to use deadly physical force, there has to be some serious threat of violence to either the officer or members of the community for that force to be justified. Now, this rule was modified in a later case called Graham v. Connor. Now, in this case, the Supreme Court set up a standard from which all police use of force incidents will be judged. Now, the Supreme Court said that a particular application of force must be judged through the perspective of a reasonable officer facing the same set of circumstances without the benefit of 2020 hindsight and based on the totality of facts that are known to that officer at the time force was used. This is our objectively reasonable standard. Now, with these two standards, let's hear what happened from the official facts from the Kentucky AG and see if we can determine whether officers were justified or not in their use of force in this particular incident. And again, this is not legal advice. So the first thing we should look at is the media coverage against no-knock warrants. In some places, they've even banned the use of no-knock warrants because of the implications of this case. So let's see how the fact that officers obtained a no-knock warrant affected the outcome of this case. Evidence shows that officers both knocked and announced their presence at the apartment. The officer's statements about their announcement are corroborated by an independent witness who was near in a proximity to apartment four. In other words, the warrant was not served as a no-knock warrant. So even though officers obtained a no-knock warrant, they knocked and announced. So the no-knock provision in the warrant application wasn't even applicable in this case. Let's continue on with the recitation of the facts by the Kentucky AG. When officers were unable to get anyone to answer or open the door to apartment four, the decision was made to breach the door. After breaching the door, Sergeant Mattingly was the first and only officer to enter the residence. Sergeant Mattingly identified two individuals standing beside one another at the end of the hall, a male and a female. In his statement, he says that the male was holding a gun, arms extended in a shooting stance. Sergeant Mattingly saw the man's gun fire, heard a boom, and immediately knew he was shot as a result of feeling heat in his upper thigh. Now, here's our first question. 
were the officers in this situation, were they facing a serious threat to themselves or to members of the community based on what you just heard? Remember, that's our threshold question from Tennessee v. Gardner. Your decision to make. Let's continue. Kenneth Walker fired the shot that hit Sergeant Mattingly. Now to clip any confusion about who shot first, let's listen to Mr. Walker's interview with police. I just let off one shot. Like I still can't see who it is or anything. So now the door's like flying open. Then all of a sudden there's a whole lot of shots. So let's continue with the AG giving us more facts. And there's no evidence to support that Sergeant Mattingly was hit by friendly fire from other officers. Mr. Walker admitted that he fired one shot and was the first to shoot. In addition to all the testimony, the ballistics report shows that the round that struck Sergeant Mattingly was fired from a nine millimeter handgun. The LMPD officers fired 40 caliber handguns. Sergeant Mattingly returned fire down the hallway. Mattingly fired six shots. Almost simultaneously, Detective Cosgrove, also in the doorway, shot 16 times. This all took place in a matter of seconds. So now we have an officer shot, two officers standing in the doorway, and they return fire to the place that they were shot from. We now have to ask our second question. Would a reasonable officer in their position have returned fire to the place that was shooting at them? You have one officer shot and they know where the shots are coming from. That's your question. Is it reasonable for these officers to respond to that fire in this way? In total, six bullets struck Ms. Taylor. Medical evidence obtained by our team indicates that only one shot was fatal. Further medical evidence shows that Ms. Taylor would have died from the fatal shot within a few seconds to two minutes after being struck. Detective Hankinson fired his weapon 10 times, including from a outside sliding glass door and through a bedroom window. So now we have to ask our two questions for this officer who was outside the bedroom window. Number one, was he presented with a serious threat to both himself or either to members of the community or even to the other officers? Now, since he's outside, he had no visual acuity. He couldn't see what was going on inside. So is that enough to say there was a serious threat to that officer or even to the other officers? Now, even if you resolve that, you have to also ask, was his response to that threat reasonable? Understand, he's outside. He can't see what's going on inside. And he then returns fire blindly into the apartment. Now, technically, it could have just been the police firing. He doesn't know. It could have been, he could have also hit the police, right? The two, his two partners inside, he could have shot. And those bullets actually went into other apartments, as you're going to hear soon. So now, you have to ask yourself, even if there was a serious threat, was his use of force reasonable, reasonable in that situation? That's a question you have to decide. Some bullets traveled through apartment four, and into apartment three before some exited that apartment. At the time, three residents of apartment three were at home, including a male, a pregnant female, and a child. There is no conclusive evidence that any bullets fired from Detective Hankinson's weapon struck Ms. Taylor. So now we're at the end of our analysis. So what have we learned? Well, we learned that the police were not at the wrong address. We also learned that the police knocked and announced this was not a no knock warrant situation. We also now know that there was some involvement of Breonna Taylor in this criminal activity. At least she knew about it, but the level of involvement we're still unsure about. Now, here is my question for you, my jury. First, was the warrant for this location based on probable cause? In other words, was there a high probability that evidence of criminal activity would have been found during a search of Breonna Taylor's apartment. And number two, were these officers justified in their use of force? Now, the state has come out and made it very clear that the two officers in the doorway who were fired upon, their response was justified. But the officer who was standing 
outside who fired blindly into the apartment was not justified and he was charged. So let me know in the comment section. Do you agree with what the state did? Do you not agree with what happened? Was this shooting justified? Was it not justified? As always, I leave it to you in the comment section. Can't wait to hear what you say. Now, if you've made it to this part of the video and you haven't subscribed to the channel, come on, really, what are you doing to me? Hit that subscribe button and join me on my journey to 100,000 subs. Now, my name is Nate, Laura YouTuber. I want to thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time. Peace.